Uh, welcome to the December 3rd History Bites presentation sponsored by the Amherst Historical Society with technical help from our friends at Amherst Media. Uh, my name is George Naughton and I'm president of the Amherst Historical Society. And today our guest is Ms. Jacqueline T. Lynch who will talk about her novel of the four towns which were submerged by the Quabbin Reservoir in the 1930s. Uh, from looking at her website, um, it seems Ms. Lynch is a prolific novelist, playwright, historian, blogger on a variety of topics. Um, I read her book, Beside the Still Waters, uh, and I think her diversity of interests comes through in the way she's able to paint portraits of people and scenes. So take it away, Jacqueline Lynch. Thank you very much, Mr. Naughton. I'm just going to, uh... well, good afternoon. I'm very grateful to the Amherst Historical Society and to Mr. Naughton for this opportunity to discuss the background of my novel, Beside the Still Waters, which is about community and the loss of community and how our hometowns make up a big part of our family heritage and our personal identities and how our hometowns, uh, well, specifically, of course, about the four towns that were demolished to make way for the Quabbin Reservoir. This is a brief description of the story of the novel. Four towns are dismantled slowly while their inhabitants grieve for a history and heritage that has been voted away from them. The present threatens, the future belongs to the fearless. Based on the actual event that destroyed four towns in central Massachusetts for the construction of the Quabbin Reservoir, families are divided between those who protest the construction project, those who give up and leave, and those who help to build it. Jenny Vaughn comes of age facing the extinction of her community and becomes the guardian of her family's heritage and ultimately the one to decide what happens to them. Well, that's the blurb of the story, but for the historical background of the novel, the Quabbin Reservoir is the largest inland body of water in Massachusetts. It was built between 1930 and 1939. Only three communities in Western Massachusetts today get their water from the Quabbin. These are Chigabee, Wilbraham, and a part of South Hadley. The majority of the towns, some 40 of them, that get their water supply from the Quabbin are in the Eastern part of the state in the Boston area. This is a map from 1912. It shows the towns as they were. The Dana is in the upper right there. Prescott in the upper left. In the central part of the valley is Greenwich, and in the southernmost is Enfield. The idea for creating the reservoir uh, was to um, utilize the three branches of the Swift River that flow through the valley and uh, dam up the point in the southern part where they were, became one and let the valley fill up from the inside. It was just that simple in theory and a real feat of engineering to conduct the, the dams and the spillways and the tunnel to let the water flow to Boston. But of course, other things were not so simple. This is a map from 1856. Uh, it's difficult to see because the words are so small, but you see on the map um, the names of the people who live there, the locations of their farms, their houses, same old names that have been there forever. Uh, the berries, the double days. This is also 1856, a little bit more Prescott there. Pierce, same old family names. The idea was conceived in 1918, but construction did not begin until 1930. It took years for legislation to be written and approved, and four whole towns, of course, needed to be systematically dismantled and all the people removed, all the buildings, 36 miles of the Boston and Albany Railroad Athol branch, uh, so-called the Rabbit Line. Originally, it was called the Springfield Athol and Northeastern Railroad. 
and all the graves and all the church graveyards needed to be exhumed and removed. Today, most of them are reinterred in the Quabbin Park Cemetery in Ware. On the right is a Memorial Day ceremony by some of their descendants some years ago. On the left is an original uh, graveyard as it stood in Enfield. Some buildings were moved intact to other locations. For example, the First Prescott Congregational Church was moved to South Hadley. You'll see it today as the Joseph Allen Skinner Museum, part of the Mount Holyoke College uh, campus in South Hadley. On the right is the church as it looks today as a museum. On the left is where it stood originally. The North Prescott Methodist Episcopal Church was moved to Orange in 1949, and then it was moved again to New Salem in 1985, where it forms part of the building complex of the Swift River Valley Historical Society. On the right is where it looks today, or actually as it looked shortly after it was moved in the mid 80s to New Salem. And on the left is where it stood originally. The Colonial Atkinson's Tavern in Prescott, it was both a, a store and a, a tavern run by Revolutionary War figure John Atkinson, was moved in 1928 and is now part of the Storden Village on the grounds of the Eastern States Exposition. You'll know it as Storden Tavern. On the right is where it looks today and on the left is as it stood back in Prescott. At last, they had to clear the valley floor of all vegetation. Every tree, every bush, all the crops, until there was nothing left but a dirt floor. Finally, the state picked the official day of the legal existence of the four towns, April 28, 1938. On the night of April 27th, a farewell ball was held in uh, pretty much the only building left standing at that point, the Enfield Town Hall. This is a postcard of it back in the day. At the stroke of midnight, the towns ceased to exist. Of course, by that time, they had already been demolished. The following summer, the diversion tunnel was blocked up and the valley was allowed to fill up from the Swift River. It took seven years and the Quabbin Reservoir was full in June, 1946. The tops of about 60 hills and mountains in the valley were all that remained. The hilltops were now islands. This is an interesting uh, map. It's actually a 1922 map, but someone superimposed the modern footprint, the modern outline of the Quabbin Reservoir over it. So you can see how the uh, original neighborhoods and streets were affected, what was covered and what was not covered. Again, we have Dana on the upper right, Prescott on the left, Greenwich in the center. Because of its low population, Green, Greenwich was, it's pretty much all covered by the water. And in the southernmost part is Enfield. Uh, when you visit the Quabbin Visitor Center uh, in Belchertown, you're actually, well, you would have been in Enfield at the time. But the timeline of the Quabbin and the whole story of the Swift River Valley goes back much farther to the turn of the century. It took two generations from proposals, ideas, legislative action, lawsuits, to buying up of properties and bulldozing homes and building the dams and the support of construction. Even before that, Boston's chronic problem of not enough fresh water to serve its growing population meant that it looked farther and farther west for a solution. I'll just read a little bit from my novel here. By 1848, when Jerusha's father was a boy in Prescott, Boston had outgrown Jamaica Pond and its polluted state led to epidemics. A new aqueduct then linked the city to Lake Kachichewit and Natick a little farther west. From this pipe, water flowed out from a fountain on Boston Common. In 1870, Lake Kachichuit required augmentation from the Sudbury River, as the supply was not enough. Not enough to put out Boston's Great Fire of 1872. 
By 1878, when Jerusha was a girl in Prescott, the aqueduct from the Sudbury River to Lake Achichuit was completed. It wasn't enough. Boston desperately required more. A new water source then tapped into the Nashua River a little farther west. In 1898, a year after the first subway in America was built in Boston, the Wachusett Reservoir began construction farther west. Some 360 homes, four churches, eight schools, six mills were removed from pieces of four different towns, Boylston, West Boylston, Clinton, and Sterling. Completed in 1908, the Wachusett Reservoir was the largest man-made reservoir in the world, but still not large enough. Soon, the Metropolitan District Water Supply Commission was formed to make studies on the diversion of the Millers, Swift, and Ware Rivers, even farther west in central Massachusetts. By 1921, when a second survey of the Swift River Valley was concluded, Boston's population had grown to about 748,000. As a response to the suggestion that a new reservoir should be created, in the Swift River Valley. The Athol Transcript published an editorial poem which Walter Vaughn read aloud. Prescott is my home, though rough and poor she be, the home of many a noble soul, the birthplace of the free. I love her rock-bound woods and hills, they are good enough for me. I love her brooklets and her rills, but couldn't, wouldn't, and shouldn't love a man-made sea. It was only the first in a long line of written protests, tributes, and memorials that the subject would inspire over many decades. Here are a few images taken by state photographers from the air in the summer of 1930, just before construction started. It's a frozen moment in time before the towns were demolished. Small villages, quiet farms, pristine lakes. This is the Swift River Valley of my novel. This is what the novel's about. The story begins in 1904 and spans three generations of one family and how they learn about the news that they're to lose their homes when a massive reservoir is to be built and how they adapt to a new and unthinkable reality. This is an interesting photo. The red arrow points to Mount Monadnock in New Hampshire. <laughs> the photograph is of uh, North Dana, but you can see that far into New Hampshire. Most of us feel a sense of loss when a store we knew when we were kids or a school is closed down or a lot of times these days, church closings are causing quite a lot of anxiety for people. Imagine the depth of angst over losing your entire town. This is Enfield. The red arrow points to that Enfield town hall that we saw in the postcard a little earlier. When I first got the idea of writing this novel, it was spurred by a remark that a former resident of one of the towns made to me. I interviewed her for a magazine about 30 years ago. The lady's name was Eleanor Griswold Schmidt. The book is dedicated to her and to another former resident, Walters Donston King. They were very helpful, became friends and valued sources on what it was like to grow up in the Valley in the 1920s and 30s when all of this activity was going on. I think Mrs. Schmidt gave more interviews than anybody and we are the, the beneficiaries of her memories. The red arrow points to Mrs. Schmidt in this group. She remarked during one visit I had with her and her siblings uh, that she and her, her siblings and friends knew from earliest memory that their town had already been given a death sentence, that it wouldn't be there when they grew up. That's a strange thing for a child to carry on her shoulders. Many young people, when they get to be teenagers, they dream of moving away from their hometowns. Some do and some don't. But these children never had a chance to live out their lives 
uh, here. They had to leave. There was no question of them ever coming home again, even for a visit. They could see their town steadily decay around them, dismantled by construction workers a little more every day. And as an interesting uh, kind of a graphic illustration of that point, this is an honor roll from the town of Enfield. Now it stands on the grounds of the Swift River Valley Historical Society. It is a memorial to the boys from that town who served in World War. It does not say World War I. There was no World War II, not for Enfield. Enfield uh, left existence in 1938. World War II did not start until 1939. Time stopped. And this is a, an interesting example of that. This too is an honor roll from Prescott. Same thing, honoring the men from the World War. The ones in black at the bottom are the fellows who died in that war. What must it be like to know that the town your family has lived in for generations, in the case of these towns since the 1700s, is going to disappear? And not from something sudden and violent and drastic like a natural disaster or destroyed through war, both horrific events, of course. But oddly, their towns were going to be destroyed over a couple of decades in a slow planned death. And because of a law passed by some men in the state house who calmly decided this was a good idea. Their ancestors received the property through the grant by a king of England, and it was taken away by democracy using eminent domain. This is the Swift River Hotel. I love the bunting all over for this celebration. And uh, in the front there on the second floor veranda, a large banner, a large portrait of George Washington. Well, their parents and their grandparents were appalled over the whole situation. Some never really got over it. It was just as psychologically devastating for them, perhaps as if a natural disaster would have been. But how does a child feel? Many of them did not come to the realization of the sacrifice that had been made until they themselves were elderly and many years had passed and they could never go home again never to show their children where they grew up. This is a cute photo of the baseball teams. The, on the left was the Enfield Town team. On the right, the Dana boys. I don't know if they ever played each other. It's interesting to think that our communities are a huge part of our personal heritage and give us a sense of belonging. These kids spent their childhoods during the Great Depression. They were young adults during World War II. And in the decades afterward, as for so many Americans, that was spent playing catch up with their careers and starting families. It wasn't until many years had passed that the enormity of what they had lost hit them. There was a link they wanted to share with their children and grandchildren as we all do, but that link had been broken. Here's another passage from my novel about a couple who leave Prescott to resettle in North Amherst when they've gotten the news that their uh, town is being taken over. North Amherst at that time was not so very different from Prescott, a small community based mainly upon small agriculture. That one fact should have been sound and simple, but all the many other differences glaring to George and Eliza stood in the way of their ever feeling completely at home George and Eliza felt lost in Amherst, so close to Prescott, yet its heritage was not their heritage. Both grew up in Prescott, he on a windswept hilltop, she in a sunny hollow. George married Eliza after having seen her three times, twice at prayer meetings and once in a sleigh ride. He told his parents he wanted to marry her before she knew anything about it, and his parents nodded. When he proposed to her, it was the first time she'd been alone with him. The second time was on their wedding night. George brought her home to his parents' house and took as much care as he could to make her feel at home because that was what Eliza expected of him. Eliza was a respectful daughter to his parents because they expected it of her. 
and they welcomed her as the daughter they never had when she met them for the first time on her wedding day. Everyone knew what his place was, and when Asa Vaughn called her daughter instead of her name, which he did until the end of his life, he meant it. It showed that he took responsibility for her as a member of his family, and that she would take responsibility for him when he was too feeble to take care of himself. When he died, she grieved more than anyone. Now Eliza stood on the very real and solid threshold of her own farmhouse in North Amherst and felt more lost and alone than she did that day she approached George's father and mother with a carpet bag and a shy nod. She told herself she should feel freedom and a carefree way about moving in with her husband of many years, her nearly grown sons and a fresh start. She felt horribly, sadly lost. This postcard, incidentally, is of what was called the New Barn at the time, Massachusetts Agricultural College. A few of the characters in the novel attend Amherst College and the Massachusetts State College. The old Aggie. Today, the Quabbin Visitor Center, and of course the organization Friends of Quabbin, has resources to learn about the Valley Towns, very good ones, and they're well worth a visit. Another museum is uh, the Swift River Valley Historical Society out in North New Salem. The church I mentioned previously is there on the left, the Whitaker Clary House in the front foreground there. There's more outbuildings in the back. These buildings are filled with family heirlooms donated by the last generation, documents and photographs furniture, quilts, and farm implements. It's their memorial to themselves and really to a way of life. Sometimes I think we treat the so-called lost towns of Quabbin as if they were a fairy tale, like Brigadoon. But there was an everyday mundane reality that is lovingly preserved at the Swift River Valley Historical Society. And it is that everyday reality that I tried to capture in my novel. Here is Greenwich Village nestled at the foot of Mount Zion. There was Walker's Mill Pond, Den Mill, Parker Hill, lots of hills and mountains, small mountains, later became islands. On this one, we see the railroad shooting up through North Dana. It's that straight line on the left. In Greenwich, there was a lake called Quabbin Lake. In Enfield, the Great Quabbin Hill and the Little Quabbin Hill. Nobody knew at the time how prophetic those names were. Quabbin is an Algonquin word said to mean place of many waters. This is a modern map of the Quabbin. Of course, Greenwich at the center of the valley is completely flooded. North Dana up in the upper right is uh, a lot of that comprises watershed land. Prescott on the upper left uh, had the highest elevation of all the towns. So there's a good chunk of it that's above water. Today, of course, it is known as the Prescott Peninsula because it is surrounded on three, three sides by water. The red arrow there points to just about where Eleanor Schmidt's father's farm was. And Enfield, of course, in the southern part. The reservoir is a, a really interesting structure. It was created during the Great Depression and like a number of other public works projects around the country at the time, it provided jobs. Because the Swift River Valley formed a kind of a natural bowl, the reservoir was as much nature made as man made. And though, of course, we sympathize with the loss of the towns, one must really admire the engineering skill that made this place, this really beautiful place, because its location in Central Mass is, of course, at a higher elevation than the towns around Boston. The water flows there through a network of tunnels uh, by gravity. My novel, Beside the Still Waters, touches only briefly on the engineering story of the Quabbin. 
most of the story is about the people who lived there and had to leave. It's a family saga beginning in 1904. A man runs his small family farm in Prescott and he decides to leave it to one of his two sons, thereby creating friction between them. And the story carries us through the 1920s and 1930s when the third generation of children are growing up as the last generation in the valley. And the fight among them about who gets to inherit the farm kind of blows up in their faces when it turns out the state's going to take the farm. Ultimately, the young granddaughter of the family patriarch is the one who decides what's going to happen to them and what they're all going to do next. It's a kind of coming of age story. And we experience life in the valley, what it was like to live on a hilltop farm with no electricity, no running water, a quilting bee, town picnics, and the final school days when the end of their towns draws near. Here again, I'll just read a little bit from my novel. Back in the valley, those who had not yet left had much to consider, but few choices. After 1935, things began to move quickly. Dana's population, which had been decreasing steadily, was now down to 387 people. While unobserved and relinquished, Prescott's population dropped to 18. Prescott had been doomed for a generation, but Dana citizens were not given the official word whether their town would be required as well until very nearly the end. Greenwich and Enfield, which up to this time had lost inhabitants slowly, often replaced by transient renters, now began to face the inevitable. The last active factory in the valley, a Swift River box company, was shut down this year. The abandonment of the local railroad forced the old factory to move its production from North Dana to Athol. That pokey little train service, which epitomized the isolation and yet strong sense of community binding the four towns together was discontinued. In June, the last ride on the old rabbit run was taken by about a hundred who wanted to say they'd done it. Old Mr. Doan was called out from retirement to yell, all but it was all he would venture to say about the whole matter. Then the tracks were pried up. Finally, the state picked the official day of the end of the existence of the four towns. April 28, 1938. On the night of April 27th, a farewell ball. At the stroke of midnight, the towns ceased to exist. Again, I'll just read this passage from my book. The Vaughns drove in their truck with the Lewis car behind. Dick and Jenny rode with his brother and sister-in-law, and Jenny gaped out the car window at the barren valley floor. There were no trees, no landmarks or buildings, only a lingering ribbon of road in the desolate plain following the torn old railroad bed and a finger of the swift river which flowed down from an equally barren Greenwich. It seemed to Jenny the face of the moon could not be so uninhabitable. Roger opened the door for the ladies as they entered the town hall. He patted Jenny's shoulder for their mutual reassurance. Bodies jostling from the bandstand to the balcony. The small orchestra played modern dance tunes and the younger set thought perhaps they might enjoy themselves after all. Their parents and grandparents shook hands, wiped the tears, and tried to remember everything that ever happened to them in this place. Their real fear was no longer over leaving. It was now about forgetting. Dr. Wendell, who seemed almost ironically revived by the shattering experience, led the grand march. The crowd looked to him and thought to themselves, yes, we'll be all right. He had delivered most of them into the world they knew. He had set bones and treated illness, gave them necko wafers when they were children. He held the hands of the dying, held confidences and secrets. No single man in the entire valley was as important, and they treasured him. They wished they could tell him how much. <laughs> 
Instead, for years afterwards, they told their children and grandchildren. Just before midnight, he stopped the orchestra with the slightest tremor of his weakened old hands. He drew himself up, though fragile with age, and summoned all the dignity and proportion in him as the town hall grew quiet. He looked at them, almost sternly, as if warning them to mind themselves, and said in a clear baritone voice, Ladies and gentlemen, goodbye. Then he nodded silently to them. A New Englander is both welcome and farewell. A spare movement of economy, it required little energy, expressing only acknowledgement, which was everything. They only wanted to be acknowledged. Eli, hands shaking, eyes blurred, tugged his grandfather's watch from his vest pocket. His family pulled closer to him to watch over his arm as the second hand swept past midnight. Dana, Massachusetts was gone. Enfield, Massachusetts was gone. Greenwich, Massachusetts was gone. Prescott, Massachusetts was gone. But life did go on. These people became productive citizens and raised their families in other towns. Though one family who left their Greenwich home for good um, settled in a section of Chicopee that was once called the Tobacco Plains because of it had a stretch of commercial broadleaf tobacco plantation. In the late 1930s, this particular land was sold again by the city of Chicopee to the Army Air Corps for Westover Air Force Base. And uh, that family had to go on its way again. And the Quabbins become a beautiful resource for us to enjoy. What was once open farmland, especially in Prescott, became forest again and supports a great diversity of wildlife. Um, bald eagles, of course, loons, moose, deer, coyotes, black bears, foxes, bobcats, among other species that had disappeared from the area in the early or by the early 20th century, now once again thrive here. For many years, the Quabbin Reservoir permitted a bus trip sponsored by the Swift River Valley Historical Society to allow people to visit the Prescott Peninsula, which is otherwise restricted. On one such trip, well over 30 years ago, I was privileged to go along with a group of former residents, including Mrs. Eleanor Schmidt, and we visited the site of our old family farm this is the eastern view from what had been their home uh, beyond to the distant hills of Worcester County. Mrs. Schmidt actually was instrumental in starting these bus trips. Here is Eleanor with uh, her brother Edward Griswold and another former resident, uh, Prescott resident, uh, Lois Barnes. Most of that generation are gone now and the memory of their towns and their way of life is left to us only in heirlooms and in the memories they left. And in a way, the Quabbin Reservoir is their greatest legacy to us. Thank you very much for listening. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of Beside the Still Waters, it's available in print and ebook from Amazon, Barnes and Noble, a lot of other online shops. You can also check your local libraries you can get information on my other books at my website, JacquelineTLynch.com. If anyone has any questions, I'll try to answer them. And if any of you have any connection to the Valley Towns, I'd like to hear your story. Thank you very much. Well, I have to say that um, read your novel and there's a powerful sense of place around the whole thing, which your talk also talks about, that um, you seem to have a very strong sense of home and the particulars of um, the community you grew up in. Um, was that, that was one of your focuses when you were writing this novel about people who, um, who lost their homes, who had the sense of place and then, um, then had to say goodbye. 
you say that's true? I think that can be really a universal uh, feeling, perhaps especially when you reach a certain age in your life and you tend to get a little more nostalgic about things. I don't know how nostalgic 13-year-olds are, although I think I certainly was even then. <laughs> uh, I grew up in a different situation. I grew up in, in Chigabee, which uh, uh, most people might think of as a, uh, a factory town. It certainly was at one point. Uh, but there was a very strong sense of family and personal identity. So I could, it doesn't matter if you grow up on a farm or a city, you, if you have that feeling, you can appreciate that feeling in other people. And especially the Swift River Museum, um, as you talk about the communities that they didn't just fade away, they were going along and then suddenly it was cut off. And when places like the Swift River Museum save their memorabilia, it's really like a snapshot in time. Um, it's not just a few things that happen to have been saved. It's, it's everything from a very limited period. So you get a different perspective. You, well, you get this um, more of a complete sense of what life would have been like at that particular historic moment. You really do. It's a very uh, powerful uh, display when you think about that. You walk am among those rooms with those artifacts. As you say, it's, it has a, a finite timeline. And um, it, it really is a powerful feeling that comes over when you get a great sense of place and of time and of history. My wife teaches school and they have a replica of a one room schoolhouse there at Swift River and and here are the books that they used and here are the desks that they used and it's mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's not quite as if all of the children just left for lunch and they'll be back soon but it's it's almost yes. like <laughs> Another thing that I thought was interesting that I, 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 didn't, I don't know how much I played up with the book. I think I mentioned it once or twice, but I didn't harp on it, is that if you, for anyone who had a chance to speak with these former residents, the ones who stayed there, who stayed close by in the towns around uh, Pelham and Belchertown and all that, um, and I think of Mr. Schmidt particularly, but also Mr. King and several others I spoke with, they had a very strong, what I would call a unique accent. It was an accent of people whose family had lived in one isolated spot for generations. And it is not unlike what you might have heard if you've ever been to, well, I don't wanna say it's, it's exactly like uh, Plymouth Plantation, but if you've ever been to, uh, a place like that where they, the people try to speak in the original accent, they're, they're still speak in their original accent because they never blended out with outsiders. And uh, that's gone, except for, thank heavens, people who might have left oral histories. I would love someday, if anyone ever made a movie about, about the valley and what happened there, they've got to listen to the oral histories and pick up the accents because those are precious. Well, there is a film from the 1970s um, about the old Yankee farmers off in the hills. Um, Greenfield Community College partnered with WGBY and they created a film. It's called Root Hog or Die. Um, we link to it from the Amherst History website. It's now on YouTube. Um, but it's in the 1970s, it was the old 70 and 80 year old Yankee farmers talking about their lives and and they have the accents. Yeah. There's a question. Mr. Rosenthal. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live in Amherst and I have just a couple of comments. First, I just want to thank you, Ms. Lynch, for bringing this to us today. What a wonderful report you've given us and insight into Thank this you. history. Thank you. I, I think most of us know that the names of these four old towns live on at Hampshire College, where they're the names of residential houses there. Of course, Greenwich isn't pronounced Greenwich at Hampshire College. It's Greenwich. <laughs> and 
but the, 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 the names came to Hampshire because of Toby Dakin, Winthrop Saltonstall Dakin, who was at the time in the 1960s, the town moderator of Amherst, the town of Amherst, and very much interested in preserving history. He was also the man who suggested that the name of the college be the county in which it resides. That's my first comment. The second is, I have an old business colleague named David Liu, L-O-U-X, and his father was from Greenwich. And David comes from Florida, where he lives now, to the Quabbin occasionally. The last time I know he was here was three and a half years ago for a burial in that cemetery of an old family member. And we got together, and of course, he wanted to talk about the town he never knew because he was born after his father had to leave because of the coming of the reservoir. But it remains a very, very live place in the memory of David Liu, and I think for all of us. So thank you very much again. Oh, not at all, thank you. The interesting thing about that cemetery, the Quabbin Park Cemetery, for me is that, and, and again, it, it's another illustration that we are talking about a location that had a finite timeline and was destroyed is that the new graves are set up in such an orderly and meticulous fashion. Whereas if they were, uh, if, if you go to a, a, your own family cemeteries, people are in different locations. You, you know, aunt so-and-so is over there and uncle so-and-so is over there because of the different years they were, that uh, plots opened up. Uh, this is all, they're all together in their towns. And you can see this is, this was a plan created cemetery at one point in time. It didn't happen over generations. It was created plunk, there it is. It's a strange feeling. It's a very eerie feeling. And I think it continues to bolster the, uh, the haunting aspect of the story. Are there other questions? I have one more question. You had a character, I forget his name, was it Alonzo at the end, who refuses to give up um, in this, the narrative of the book. He's left sort of wandering the hills thinking <laughs> that he's going to live on the outskirts of his town under whatever circumstances forever. Mm -hmm. um, is that based on history? Did, that, did people do that? Um, I sort of stretched it a little bit there. I spoke to a woman whose father, actually, who was it? It might have been Eleanor, uh, did not want to leave, refused to leave, and um, stayed it, pretty late. It was, gosh, it must have been even after Let's see, the hurricane of 38 was in September. The farewell ball was in April. So it was well after the farewell ball, well after the town's officially demised, her father was still there. And uh, I think they would have had to come and get him except that he died. I, he became ill and died. Um, so I thought, well, okay, the reservoir was filling up. The uh, officials had other things that they were doing. They would have eventually went back and did one final check and removed the last people forcibly if they had to. Uh, they didn't have to with this gentleman, he passed, but he was determined to stay. So Alonzo just came up out of a, a, a fanciful of what, what would happen if, and this is what writers do, they take an idea and they say, what if? What if this happens? And then what if that other thing happens? And so it was a what if, what if this much younger man a uh, much more powerful, uh, vigorous man decided he wasn't going to be moved. What would happen? You know, mm -hmm. that's how that came out. And it's a way of closing the circle, I suppose, in a narrative that you have all the different reactions of the people. Um, the ones who just sort of say, okay, you know, I'm gone. And then others who leave at different points. And and by golly, there's the one guy who isn't going to leave. Are there other questions? I don't see any other hands up. 
So um, thank you again for your talk. Um, thank you. Really enjoyed it. It's a good compliment to your book. Um, you should still read the book, all you people out there. Um, you still don't know all of the stories or all of the descriptions from the book. So thank you, Ms. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Naughton. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.